We are gladly um, uh, and happy to see you in Corporate University of Sberbank. And we would like to talk uh, with you about design. Mm -hmm. And uh, recently we start to talk about human-centric design. Mm -hmm. And it's an interesting question of uh, chicken and egg. What, mm -hmm. is, what is shaping what? It's human needs that are shaping the uh, great design or it's a great design that could shape the human needs. What do you think? Well, I think that uh, great design should always follow human needs. So I think that comes first because um, you can you have to consider um, the human needs in different aspects. Maybe it's more about basic things uh, like uh, shelter or warmth or comfort, or maybe you can move to other more uh, complex needs like uh, self-image or uh, like self-actualization. But uh, I don't think necessarily um, great design changes human needs because human needs will always have always existed in a similar way, but they do change um, our mediums to achieve things. So for example, maybe your needs of communication before were achieved um, through letters, and now you can just like um, send a WhatsApp message. Mm -hmm. But it, it's the same need, communicationally speaking, but you do create different expectations. So now you you want things immediately, you want everything, you want it now. So that that I think that is the way that it can affect the way that we feel uh, our needs are evolving. Well, uh, it's also interesting, you talked about functionality, you talked about our needs. Uh, what is the uh, primer uh, thing in design? Is it a, a functionality? Is it a beauty or the emotions? Uh, we are all different, we are all unique and we have different needs, mm. different emotions. Uh, uh, what is making great design? Well, I think uh, great design always needs to be a mix of the three. So you need to have function, you need to have beauty, and you need to have emotions. But uh, if you need to, um, like, perhaps think of a hierarchy, you do need um, to solve a function first, because design is about solving a problem. Otherwise, it would be more like art. So if a project is or a product is not achieving its basic function, it's, it's not like a like achieving anything, it's not working. But then you need to have this layer of, of beauty and emotion as well. You need it to be appealing to people because actually um, beauty is um, achieved in different aspects. You can find beauty in the way things work. You can also, it's also about how it looks. So it's about several like levels of interaction with people. It's about the first impression it has with you. And it's also about what you think about it afterwards. So it's also about this kind of story you have about it. So I think a great design should always think about this round picture of the three elements, always, yeah. You started from the architecture? Yes, <laughs> I'm an architect. The well, question is how you get to the idea to be an architect. And then is product design is somehow different from the urban or architecture, urban design or architecture? Mm. Well, definitely there is a, a different scale, a very um, like change of, of perspective in that sense, because in uh, urban design, you, you need to have in mind some like broader kind of problems, such as like mobility or infrastructure. And architecture, for example, is more about shelter. So you have more like an development kind of environment. And in contrast, I think product design uh, can allow you to um, achieve like more specific functions. So like the interaction with products is much more like, um, like physical. You have like a more intimate connection with products. But uh, I think that uh, everything is very connected. <laughs> so I think that it's about it, a scale. Yeah, it's about scale. But at the same time, like products affect architecture, architecture affects urban design and uh, the other way around. So. I think that is what has led me to like jump from one thing to another a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> and and what what is your initial um, dream? Uh, what was your initial dream to be an architect? How you come to this idea? Well, actually, um, 
architecture, like this decision making of architecture was quite complex. So now I see like this combination of different disciplines as a way to solve something that was initially a problem. Because when I finished high school, I had like no idea of what to do with like, like what to study or what to like field to take. So I was considering things like maybe medicine or psychology and architecture. So like things that were not very apparently related to each other. But now uh, I see that uh, through design and architecture, it's actually a good thing to have in my like different kinds of fields. So uh, at the beginning, I was like, okay, not very clear about it. But now I see that, okay, it, it fits in, the, in this big picture. Like you can have like different sorts of interests, but as an architect or designer, you're also some sort of like coordinator of things. So it's good to like uh, learn from other fields and what they're doing, different technologies, different ways of working as well. So yeah, that's... And it's your idea of cross-pollination of disciplines that could enrich the design. Yes, yes, I, I, I do believe strongly in this mix of like different disciplines because like, well, human needs in general, like we have many interests. So I think that is something that can make our product rich, like our product and our work much richer. So I like combining things that maybe are not so like um, common in, in my usual work, like maybe like gastronomy or how we're speaking about psychology. So you can always learn new things and apply things to your work. And it's also important um, as you as designer have uh, like a role of a coordinator, right? You're like the orchestrator of things. So you not only have to take care of like technical things, but also other like more practical things. So you need to develop a common language with other people. So so you have to talk with engineers, you have to talk like with different um, like field experts or even with your clients because <laughs> you need to know about business, you need to know about other things because otherwise you maybe could be speaking like a language that nobody else understands. You, you, you're not just communicating with designers. So uh, can, you, can you give an example how research and analysis uh, transform, change the initial idea of uh, clients' needs? Uh, yes, uh, I think one example could be when I was working in Panama as an architecture in, in an architecture firm, um, because we were um, working on different like multifamily units. We were working mostly in residential field, and we saw that uh, like two units or three like bedroom units were quite popular. But it was not necessarily because people were like, uh, they had like a big family or they had like lots of child because that is happening less each time. Mm -hmm. So it was mostly um, used for renting. So in that way, we had to rethink the way we were like thinking about this general scheme of the layout of the apartments. So people could have like different layers of pr privacy and different like um, access to things. So maybe from the beginning we thought that okay these are like probably for big families people are buying like huge homes for other reasons and actually it was because the use was different so you need to understand how this um way of living is evolving how the way people are working how the pe the way people are living can also affect the needs in your work like how do you translate this change of times and this change of habits into the spaces and products you create uh, what do you think about uh, personalization or individualization? Mm -hmm. We are all unique and I, 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 I was thinking about design and um, perceiving the human needs. Sometimes I don't know what I need, what I mm -hmm. want <laughs> really and what my needs are and uh, how we can uh, really uh, balancing between uh, making functional design for many people, which is, you know, mm -hmm. m makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and the evolving need of being a unique, uh, respected person mm -hmm. with your own, uh, you know, characteristics mm -hmm. which are uh, taken care of. How to, uh, how you work with it, how, how you find the uh, essence uh, between many mm -hmm. unique people. When you when you're thinking about architect architect project mm -hmm. or design a product for many, mm -hmm. and they have m different needs. Yeah, well, I, I think um, 
one way that you could approach this is that having like this different like layers and scales because maybe in architecture you solve like more general needs so you need to like provide this comfort you need to like set an overall mood but when you enter into product design you can also allow more like this kind of personalization so people uh, have like general options that solve needs according to what you perceive because it's true what you say that maybe we don't know what we want <laughs> so sometimes a good thing like a good way to learn is by observing people not by mm -hmm. asking them because maybe you ask them and they are not sure or maybe they do things but they are not conscious that they're doing that thing so a good thing is like yeah observe people to see what kind of different things they they do without noticing and also like allowing um, flexibility in your projects so you have like a general scheme but you can also allow people to to add this part of their personality into into the products they use or the services mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. offering uh what is the role of uh, design in the social life in the society in the economical life mm. Well, I think um, we think of designers in many cases as like visionaries of many things, but sometimes we miss uh, the picture that design is part of a system. So uh, changes in design in many cases have happened not only because of like technological innovations, but also because we have a change in beliefs. So we have seen it uh, through history, like uh, in the 19th century, for example, we cared a lot about like religion. So our home was a space of like sanctity and that like uh, your uh, belongings need to reflect that. So you didn't, you, you, it was not good if you faked things because people thought that if you were um, faking things or lying through your belongings, you could easily deceive people through other ways. And then, for example, in the 20th century, um, we started to care a bit less about religion and like this kind of like spiritual values. And then we cared more about like um, cleanliness or um, home like health. So design also had to like rethink uh, the like the elements in the house to reflect that. So you change maybe from products that were like very robust or like made from wood to this kind of new aesthetic that reflected that cleanliness, like very like wide shapes that were like uh, clean, uh, like easy more to... More simple. More simple, yeah. And uh, design is also very 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 much connected to um, economics and industry it's it's a part of it uh, it's a part of the system so i think an, an important uh, role in design as we were speaking it's not only about solving a function but it's also about how you translate the beliefs of society so it's about uh, making like um intangible things tangible so that's quite a complex thing to it's very interesting idea. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking we have a very changing environment now. We have, uh, we are, we are creating the the other world, and uh, given what you said, uh, how do you think the design of tomorrow will be different from design of today? What is design of today? Well, I think uh, technology is definitely going to be a key driver in the change of, of design practice because now we're going to have this new tools that can allow us to automate different processes that we're used to like um, more involved in technical parts um, with uh, technologies such as AI. So you can maybe now um, have more open space to think about other kinds of problems because now machines are going to help you do uh, these kinds of like more technological aspects of your work. So maybe uh, a big part of design tomorrow could be us teaching machines also how to do like these basic functions of our work um, like um, yeah through like machine learning or computational creativity things like that so uh, we have more like open space and mental space and time to think about more complex problems so uh, now we see that design is increasingly getting more involved in like uh, more like social political um, problems like crime and crisis or different things so I think 
maybe some people uh, are worried about like how machines can replace our jobs and like it's a frightening thing. And it's about thing. designers also, the question is. Yeah, are we they, going to lose? Yeah, yeah, I saw an article days ago that said like, oh, maybe architects are going to disappear because like machines are going to do like the plans and different layouts without you doing anything. But I mean, like, who is going to take care of the rest of the details? You need a person um, to take care of things and to talk with other people and to do that, like, that um, effect of orchestrating things and if having your creative input. Because I, I think you can teach machines to do some things, but you still need to, to have this creative input that I think it's very hard for technology to replace. So I actually um, see it in a very, like, positive um thinking like a positive way um i think yeah it, it's going to be a, a a positive change in the future hope you will have time to have a little excursion around and uh, thank you very much it was very interesting thank you thank you very much